Bicycle helmets are a divisive topic. There are people who like them, people don't. People like them and want to enforce it onto others, and people don't like them and want to enforce it onto others. When riding my bicycle, I usually wear one when travelling longer distances. Which is great because if I do fall at a low speed, it can protect my head from an injury. But the problem with helmets is not wearing one, but rather, mandating it. Singapore's mandatory helmet law was proposed by the Active Mobility Panel in 2018. However, the only evidence they had to support the proposal of mandating helmet use is the travel diary of 100 select participants in focus group discussions and a public survey of 6,000 responses, which is hugely inadequate for policy making. But before we get to helmets, we need to understand who will be affected by the law. In English-speaking countries, everyone who rides a bicycle is labelled cyclist. But in Dutch, there are two different terms. The first is a fietser, a person who uses a bike for ordinary errands to get from A to B in the most efficient manner possible. The second is a wheel runner, a person who uses a bike for sport and fitness with trips covering longer distances and at higher speeds. Wheel runners tend to wear helmets no matter whether it's legislated or not. The larger roads and greater speeds involved deem helmets necessary for an activity of higher risk. Fit ones can even hit up to 60 km per hour on their bicycle. Mandating helmets will not affect wheel runners as it is already commonly practiced. Fitzers, on the other hand, do not wear helmets as the speeds they travel at are significantly lower than that of a wheel runner. Trips conducted are also relatively short, usually completed within 20 minutes. Mandatory helmet laws will affect fitzers. Given that a mandatory helmet law will only affect people cycling and makes no difference for people who walk, take the bus, MRT, or drive, the approach of using a public survey to determine laws for a minority group is a fundamentally wrong approach. Just because you don't feel safe riding without a helmet doesn't mean that everyone else should be forced to wear one. Hence, whether one should wear a helmet or not should be rightfully treated as a personal decision, not something forced upon. Singapore has a unique situation, where cycling on footpaths is permitted at a maximum speed of 10 km per hour. Cycling infrastructure is present, but because many parts of the island are still lacking them, using the footpath or the road largely remain the only two options. If you'd like to find out more about the effectiveness of helmets, Michael Koval Anderson has explained it well. Links to his TED talk in the description below. On how likely it is to sustain a traumatic brain injury, TBI, on the road, a local study which analyzes data between 2011 and 2016 found that approximately 4 out of 5 bicycle injuries happened off-road. Head injuries made up just 12% of all injuries, much lower than 33.7% seen in the literature. This means that the likelihood of one sustaining a TBI while cycling on the road is extremely unlikely. In contrast, another study in 2006 concluded that promoting helmets should be targeted at non-residents and older people cycling with a request to consider mandating helmet usage and to target riders who ride when intoxicated. Photos of cracked helmets on social media bear testament that they can improve safety. For people who have been saved by a helmet or disabled by an injury on a bike, it is very understandable that anything that might have prevented the tragedy is self-evidently desirable and hence may welcome a helmet law. However, the implementation of such laws need to take into account other factors on a larger scale. Based on statistics by the traffic police, 9 people were killed cycling in 2019. But in that same year, 6,090 people die from cancer and 5,018 from heart diseases. This is where cycling plays a huge role as active commuting by bike has been proven to reduce the incidence of cancer by 45% and 46% for heart diseases. The panel states that mandating such a rule off-roads could dampen the uptake of active mobility but as soon as someone gets on a bike, riding at 10 km per hour is simply too slow for any practical purpose, and going faster will endanger people walking. Even if the footpath is crowded, broken, or has multiple grade changes, one is still forced to stay and not use the road even if it's clear. This ultimately creates a terrible situation for people walking and cycling. People cycling are forced to travel at a snail's pace of 10 km per hour, even if the road adjacent to it is empty, and since footpaths are never designed to handle bicycle traffic, forcing more people to cycle on footpaths only makes things worse for people walking. Well, drivers do benefit from this of course, because as soon as the road becomes clear of those pesky uncle cycling, they can comfortably cruise at 50 through residential areas. 
On an anthropological level, multiple studies which looked at countries with mandatory helmet laws, such as Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, found that there is no evidence that helmets have improved overall safety. Speaking of danger, helmet laws affect the public perception of cycling on roads as more dangerous than they are, especially when the only type of people remaining on the road are doing so at high speeds and for sport. There's no longer that familiar sight of regular people cycling to get from A to B, such as the auntie heading to the supermarket, the uncle going to buy Toto, and school children completing the last mile of their journey. This further discourages people intending to cycle on the road while dressed for the destination as it simply sticks out like a sore thumb. The fact is, keeping oneself safe is intrinsic to humans and people know what feels best for them and adjust the type of path they use accordingly. Which is why you never find an auntie riding a mama chari on Bartley Viaduct, a student in school attire bombing down Mount Faber, or an uncle travelling along fast roads except that Serangoon Road is a strode and he has no choice. The LT has proved that through enforcement, lesser people rode bicycles on the road without helmets. This made roads less filled with bicycles, but ironically, made cycling on the road even more unsafe. Researchers have shown that the more people there are cycling on the road, the more accustomed people driving will be to that site, resulting in safer roads for everyone. Doing the opposite only makes roads more dangerous, especially for users who don't have a choice of using the footpath, like e-bike riders. The panel states that helmets are required because, and I quote, on roads, cyclists travel alongside larger and faster vehicles and are the most vulnerable users. But this is a fundamentally flawed approach to road safety by simply shifting the blame to the vulnerable. Going by that logic, shouldn't helmets be mandatory for pedestrians since they are the most vulnerable on both roads and shared paths and it's the group that suffers the highest number of road accidents, or drivers since they make up the largest group for traumatic brain injuries. With the mandatory helmet law, in the unlikely event where a person is killed riding a bicycle without a helmet, the practice of victim blaming by the media and the public would be more persistent than before, as if pain and suffering are justifiable for not wearing a polystyrene hat. This insensitive advertisement on Facebook by the traffic police was published the day after a truck driver killed a 14-year-old cycling along a road. Instead of encouraging safer driving behaviour which could prevent accidents, Cycling is portrayed as a risky and dangerous activity, with PPE being glorified as the sole tool to improving safety. Or as said by Jay Foreman, The sort of people who say, why don't you wear a helmet, are usually the sort of people who've never ridden a bike in their lives, and they're only saying it because they want to absolve themselves of all responsibility for cyclist safety on the road. The biggest problem that comes with mandating helmet use is accessibility. This results in multiple areas in Singapore becoming hardly accessible to people who don't drive, not every place in Singapore has a footpath or is served by public transit. In such places, the bicycle is the only practical mode of transport to get around. In landed areas such as Serangoon Gardens, the footpaths are far too narrow for people to ride on. Wait, it's not just Serangoon Gardens, it's almost every landed estate. It also doesn't make sense to create cycling paths in there as the roads are mostly empty. As for Neotiu and Lim Chukang, agricultural businesses and cafes become completely inaccessible to people without cars. Having such laws in place will encourage people residing in landed estates to switch to driving to nearby destinations, even if they are connected by quiet roads and within comfortable cycling distance. This comes with an economic cost because it is one more car added to congestion and an environmental cost caused by car emissions. For people who do not own a bike, it makes no sense for them to purchase a helmet, carry it for the whole day, just for a one-off shared bike trip lasting no more than 10 minutes. Why are citizens being denied the freedom to travel to parts of their country by viable alternatives without a car? When I studied in secondary school, cycling on quiet roads was the fastest way to get me and many other students from the MRT to school due to the lack of public transit nearby. The journey took no more than 5 minutes and was really easy. In the past, there were usually more than 30 bicycles parked outside my school, but when I went back to visit my alma mater in 2021, there were less than 5 outside. I could of course unlock a bike and ride away, but risk being caught. The penalties for such are absolutely ridiculous. See, if I drive twice the speed limit on this neighbourhood road, the penalty is $300 and 8 demerit points off my license. But if I ride a bicycle on the same road without a helmet, I could be fined up to $1000 and be imprisoned for 3 months on first offence. It's insane that the act of not wearing a helmet which does not cause harm to others warrants imprisonment while driving twice the speed limit which could potentially kill lives is only punishable by a fine. I do not understand the rationale behind criminalizing something that is inherently safe and healthy. Even if one isn't fined or the law is not enforced, 
They matter in the unlikely event of an accident, as it can be used to determine fault and liability. Besides, the countries which mandate helmets have low cycling rates, so why are we blindly following them if the goal is to increase the uptake of cycling? We should instead look at European countries which have higher rates of cycling and analyse how policies make them so welcoming. Instead of fining people for not wearing helmets while cycling, many other governments recognise the economic and health benefits that come with the uptake of it as a mode of transport and choose to invest in people cycling, such as the UK Cycle Scheme which subsidises up to 39% of the cost of bicycles. It is also worth questioning that if mandating helmets really do improve safety by a huge margin, why aren't more than 90% of other countries following suit? Mexico, which had a mandatory helmet law for bicycles, dropped it to promote bicycle usage and project a better perception of the safety of cycling. Countries which still have mandatory helmet laws also do not apply them to all ages as science has proven that the cost-to-benefit ratio of helmet wearing is greatest for adolescents aged 10 to 16. Slovakia, South Korea and Sweden only apply them to riders under the age of 15 and failing to do so will never justify 3 months of imprisonment. While it is no doubt that helmets can prevent certain injuries, mandating them do more harm than good. Since there is no statistical data or evidence that proves that mandating helmet usage has a net positive for health and economy on a societal level in Singapore, keeping such a law in place and enforcing it ultimately wastes public funds that could be diverted for better use to prevent crashes from happening in the first place. Measures include mandating a minimum passing distance for drivers overtaking, traffic calming in neighbourhood streets, reducing speed limits to 30 in neighbourhoods, continuous footpaths or even a hoof netting to reduce delays for people. Cycling is an inherently safe activity and it's the environment that makes it dangerous. It is the environment that we need to change, not the user. While cycling infrastructure takes time to be constructed, not every place is suitable for constructing such and bicycle usage should not be made difficult to promote the uptake of cycling as a mode of transport. The mandatory helmet law is simply yet another victim-blaming policy that renders an efficient and sustainable mode of transport slow, unattractive, and when it's needed the most, unusable, against the car-like vision that we commonly hear of. This is how our streets used to be, for people to head out to enjoy and feel the wind in their hair, what these people are doing which do not cause harm to others is now punishable by the law. We should encourage the uptake of active mobility by making use of existing infrastructure and the first step to do it is to welcome people back to the space they used to have. Streets are built for people, not for cars. There's nothing wrong with wearing a helmet. If one feels comfortable wearing one, then do so. But let there be the freedom to choose, just like the rest of the world, and how it was like in Singapore not too long ago. I would like to thank Francis Chu for supplying me with footage of people who would tell if they did the same thing today. If you'd like to support the movement of removing the mandatory helmet law, you may sign a petition to show your support, link in the description box below. And if you'd like to see more videos about urban planning and transport, please consider subscribing to my channel. Thank you.